join me in the book of Colossians if you're not there already. Continue in our study this morning of the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. Here at Grace, it's our conviction, our belief, that prayer lies at the heart of the Christian faith. Prayer is the way in which we both individually and as a family together, we respond to that which God has already said in His Word. And this is our privilege as well as our responsibility that we have as God's children to communicate with Him, to respond to Him in this way that we possess the right to come boldly before the throne of the King of Kings, the author of the universe, without reservation, without appointment. And He always lends us His ear. He is always there to hear every one of His children at every point in time. And He promises not only to hear, but to respond according to His sovereign will. He will respond at the right way in the right time. That is incredible. That is an indescribable gift that we possess. The disciples were right to ask Jesus to teach them to pray. They were right to ask this, for prayer is interaction with the Father. It's interaction with God who sent Jesus to them. And while we have great freedom to speak, It is also good for us, it is healthy and right for us to develop from the scriptures a rich theology, a robust practice of prayer. It's from our observation of scripture that we find a variety of styles, different kinds of prayer, different sorts of purposes in prayer. And you'll often hear, at least here at Grace, say, an acronym that we use to describe four of these kinds of prayer. It's the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S. And that is adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. These are four different kinds of prayer. We practice two of them already as a family. We begin our service with the prayer of adoration and confession, that we acknowledge to God who He is, we rejoice in His character, and we acknowledge who we are. We agree with Him concerning ourselves, concerning our former nature of sin, and even the present battle that we have with flesh. These are adoration and confession. Now, the final two are ones that we saw and will see in the text of Colossians, Thanksgiving. Paul opened his letter on a note of Thanksgiving because he had this good news, this good word from Epaphras, uh, that the gospel, which goes forth in truth and in grace and in hope, that it had made its way abundantly to the fledgling church in Colossae. The apostle's response was to lift his hands in praise with his brothers and to rejoice in the goodness of God and the power of the gospel. So that's thanksgiving. This week, the apostle models another kind of prayer as he transitions from thanksgiving to supplication. You'll observe as we go through the text this morning that The main verb in our long Greek sentence is this negative verb, we do not cease. And it's followed with two complementary participles, we don't cease to pray and to ask. And those are related, but they move in clarity. They move toward clarity. As he says, I'm praying for you. As just as he said last week, I'm praying for you. But last week it was Thanksgiving. I rejoice and what the gospel's done, and this week I pray by asking. And that's what supplication is. Supplication is bringing our requests before the Lord. So supplication or petition is asking the Father. And as we'll see in a moment, Paul has a singular request to God on behalf of the Colossian family. Now, as we move in our study of the epistle, and again, just remembering how epistles work, you'll notice that we not only observe the relationship between the short phrases. That's very important to see how it works, and we've already 
spoken on the fact that it's from the relationship between these phrases that our theology blossoms. That's where we build theology. But we also need to observe essential relationships between bigger portions, right? because Paul is transitioning. There's a link, an anchor that he's left last week and that he picks up this week. And so you'll see that at the very beginning of this text, for this reason, since the day we heard it, and our natural response should be, for what reason, since the day you heard what? The reason that Paul moves toward supplication, toward asking, is the same reason that he moved towards thanksgiving. The gospel is advancing. The gospel is establishing itself in local families all around the world. It is bearing fruit and increasing. That places us in a unique category of people for which we should have hope and we should have sobriety. We should give thanks. Wow, look what the gospel's doing. And we also move forward very seriously, don't we? Because even the most mature among us, the, most fur the furthest in their Christian walk, would not look from now to the end of their life, from now till inheritance and say, easy, done, no big deal. This is a difficult walk. This is not, it is simple, but it's not easy. And we need to pray for each other that the gospel would continue in its success and that we would be rooted and built up in that which we already started. So the same gospel fruit that moved Paul to give thanks now moves Paul to pray, to ask for the same group of people. You notice here, this is just the connections um, between last week and this week. You see, in verses 3 through 8 and verses 9 through 14, there, there are a lot of parallels. The reality of and the constancy of his prayer for them. He and Timothy and the brothers. They, their thankfulness and their request exist consistently on behalf of the Colossian family. The importance of grateful praise which is modeled by the apostle last week and now identified this week as a characteristic of walking in a manner that is pleasing to God. So it's modeled by him and encouraged by him. This will be the fruit of faith. Another similarity is that this, these prayers began, uh, so I circled the wrong one earlier, so that they began upon hearing the good news from Epaphras concerning the abundance of growth and fruit by the true message of God's grace. And then finally, the essential relationship between knowledge, the knowledge of God, and growth. And that's something that will really come to the forefront of the text this morning. So Paul is deliberately echoing the language of his thanksgiving in his supplication. The effect of that is twofold. One, it reminds the Colossians to continue in that which they have already begun, that that body of truth which has brought to them new life is sufficient for their continued growth and maturity, a constant theme of this epistle. It also encourages us that as that the gospel is um, as much a cause for rejoicing as it is a cause for supplication. And there is the point made previously that we're in a unique category of people who have great hope, but also great seriousness and sober-mindedness. So it'd be helpful before we uh, observe really the details of the text, we're just going to do a flyover, sketch the outline so that we can have a preview of where we're going before we go there. It's a very clear outline, but there, is a few, there are a few layers to it this morning. So as we observed a moment ago, um, Paul anchors this text to the previous one before he states his singular request. And here is his singular request, that the Colossians, and we would say by extension, us, God's people, God's church, would be filled with the knowledge of his will. The intended result, the purpose of that request is that the the Colossians would walk 
in a manner that was worthy of the cause of Christ. Worthy not in the sense that we impress him, but worthy in the sense that it fits, it matches, is worthy of that identity that we now have. And that is a life fully pleasing to him. So the perp- he has one request with an intention that it would move the way that we act, that our act would follow the knowledge that we are filled with. And then he gives four characteristics, four qualities of that kind of a life, that worthy walk, you might say. They are being fruitful, increasing or growing, being strengthened, and giving thanks. Each one of these he modifies with a prepositional phrase. Fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, and giving thanks with joy. So it's not just the statement or the, of the quality, but a description of the quality that guides us in understanding what that quality is. Inside the fourth quality, there's a second sermon. <laughs> and we're going to walk through it today, but there's, there's reasons that we should give thanks to the Father. Why should we do that? Look at what he has done. Paul considers three activities of God, three of his works that the Father has accomplished on our behalf. He has qualified us to share in his inheritance. He has delivered or rescued us from the power of darkness. And he has conveyed or transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And the statement at the end that this kingdom belongs to his beloved son moves Paul to consider Jesus himself. It is in Christ then, in him that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And you can feel this transition as Paul's about to just move and, and sound forth in one of, if not the greatest Christological moments in all of the New Testament verses 15 through 20 that we'll consider next week. So, a transition into a singular request that has a purpose, the changed activity of God's people. That activity looks like these sorts of things, these four qualities of a life that is worthy of the cause, uh, worthy of Christ. And in the last one, giving thanks some motivation to remember the faithful, redemptive work of God. That should move us to rejoice. And so we'll consider that at the end before he transitions once again into a Christological consideration, the character of Jesus. Let us seek the Lord's help before we move on. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your generosity. As we consider this text, thank you already for the reminder that we are free to come before your throne. Thank you for this gift. We ask that as we seek to understand the Apostle Paul's words here that were spoken by your your spirit, that we would approach with humility Because your spirit indwells every one of your children, those who have been reborn, he is in fact the guarantee of the very inheritance you've qualified us for. He's in us. He's here with us. He promises to illuminate his word. And so we ask that you would make good on that promise today. Do not allow my words to distract from your own. I pray that they would only give clarity and that these things would not be merely intellectual, that they would stimulate our mind, that they would increase our knowledge or remembrance of the Father, but that we would be stirred by the truth, toward right action. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
if we could only pray one thing for each other, what would we pray? One request. Now, Paul's not necessarily answering that question, but surely we learn the significance of a request when it proceeds in solitude <laughs> from the mouth of the apostle. With no accompanying petition, this is it. That you may be filled. It is all of us. This is a plural, a corporate verb. That you may be filled. It is passive. Which means that there must be an active agent who does the filling. And if Paul is in the middle of praying... The active agent is most certainly the Father. So he's asking that the Father would do something, that he would move, that he would act, and his act is to fill. With what? What is he filling with? The knowledge of his will. Paul's asking that God would see fit to pour into his Christian family a super abundant portion, a full portion of the knowledge of God's will. Keep in mind here the setting of the book. We always must remember, right, as we're sitting here in 2023, we must remember this was written 2,000 years ago. And in the first century of the existence of God's church, the sufficiency of faith in Christ is under attack. Perhaps more than ever after, the people around the Colossian believers told them, even those in the church told them, you need a better knowledge. You need to supplement Jesus. Christ is a great place to begin. In him you have life. But there is so much more to experience. Surely you don't believe that you have full, adequate, complete, mature knowledge that will move you from simplicity to completeness. He's not all that. Is this not precisely what we face today? That even in the Western church, is Christ sufficient? No. No. Not at all. He's supplied all the time, supplemented all the time, which is to supplement Christ is to supplant Him. He's not sufficient. Is the Word of God sufficient to communicate all that we need for life and godliness? Can it move us into eternity safely with everything in this book? Or do we need more? Must we venture outside? Not simply for observation of his world as we learn and increase in knowledge of that which he has made, but for the spiritual maturity, for the end success of our lives, do we need more? Paul's argument is no. Notice as we walk through this, there, I didn't write this down, there's probably six at least times that Paul in this text, in this prayer, communicates fullness. And he does it here within the, in the main request, but then he uses the Greek word pos, which is all, complete. Let's, just, let's actually just, I'm going to do that as we go through. So that you may be filled with knowledge of his will, all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That you may walk with your Lord, fully pleasing to him. These are the same words, being fruitful, all good works, increasing the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, all patience and long-suffering, giving thanks with joy to the Father. I think that's all of them. You can see that this is one of his points, and he's sticking it to the opponents who say, you need fullness out here. He says, everything, complete fullness, maturity, abundance, it's all right here. Continue in it. Walk in it. God, please fill them 
to overflowing with the knowledge of your will in order that they may live the abundant life you intend, not abundant in the way that Western Christianity might propose it, but abundant in the way that the Apostle Paul means it, abundant in the eternal sense, that we might live the abundant intended life, the life that pleases God, that fits with Christ. So what is the knowledge of His will? <laughs> if that's His main request and that's what we're being filled with, then we better understand what it is, right? What is the knowledge of His will? One of the most important phrases here. It's important that we clarify, particularly because of the way that we normally refer to God's will. Normally, when we speak toward each other about God's will, and even as the, many of the texts speak of it, uh, we're speaking of His intention for our life, the direction of our life. We normally talk about decision-making and wisdom. We need, God's, we need to know God's will, where I should go, what I should do. That is not in view. That is not what Paul is talking about. So every time you come to this text and we trip over God's will like, he, I know what he wants me to do. No, not what he wants you to do. We're talking about the salvific will of God. We're talking about his redemptive intention. We're talking about what Paul was filled with in Acts chapter 22 when he's recounting his testimony. And he says concerning uh, Ananias, this devout man who came to him uh, by the voice of God to help him receive his sight. He says, uh, then Ananias said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. Ananias is not saying the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his path for your life. He's saying the God of our fathers has chosen you to understand the gospel, to understand the character of God, to understand what his intention is in redemption, and then to go speak it, to go proclaim what he has seen and what he has heard. In even the book of Colossians, in verse 10, Paul, uh, Paul equates this knowledge of his will to simply the knowledge of God. And then in chapter 2, verse 2, he says that we would attain to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, which is the gospel to the world, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So what we're talking about here is understanding who God is and what he's doing through Christ. And if we know that, if we know God and his intention, we are moved with gratitude to activity. In the phrase that follows, Paul attends wisdom, or he attends knowledge uh, with wisdom and understanding. Two words that, they're not synonyms, but they are related and they're often paired together. Significantly, they're paired in first century Greek thought, <laughs> as well as ancient Yahwehist Israeli thinking. Okay, so it's older than Greek thought. So the virtues are paired together, wisdom, understanding, knowledge. These are, you know, Aristotle's chief intellectual virtues. This is premier in the Greek mind. But Solomon, the wisest king to walk the earth, communicated the relationship of these ideas long before. And so Paul, what he does is he raises the two. He says, let us examine. Let us compare these ideologies. Let us see which one is full. Let us see which one is of God. And there would be our answer for which one to pursue for maturity. Which one contains completeness? Which one is from the throne of God? 
So these two helpful adjectives, and I actually think that spiritual is the, is the primary adjective in this clause. The both of them go with both words, so we, might, we don't need to read all wisdom and spiritual understanding. It is all, all wisdom and all understanding, and they're spiritual. Both of them are spiritual, so it's all spiritual, both wisdom and understanding. The reason that he uses spiritual as an adjective here is to remind us of the source of these things. Where do wisdom and understanding come from? From where do they proceed? If this is the instrument of filling the believer with all the knowledge of his will, where does that come from? It proceeds from the Spirit of God. There's probably not a text that describes this better than Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And it's a little extended, but it's, it pairs so perfectly that I want to read it for you, beginning in verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, that'll come up in a moment, who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us, how? Through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. You want, a, you want a divine mystery? Look to the Spirit. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God expect, except the Spirit of God. Who better to teach us about God but God himself? Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. There they are pitted against each other again. That we might know... <laughs> the things which have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. This is the source of, of all knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. It is only by Him that we could be filled to overflowing with confidence, right? A lot of people say a lot of things. A lot of people know a lot of things. But if you do not have complete knowledge, you cannot have certain knowledge because there always might be something you just don't know. So the only source of assured information can be the one who knows all things. And here he's spoken to us, and it is Paul's request that he would continue to fill us to abundance. Now, what is the purpose of that knowledge? The intention of Paul's prayer, certainly not to create spiritual intellectuals who move through this life with their big brains full of information about the divine. And that's not the purpose. The true knowledge of God is transformative in the conduct of the recipient. Knowing the God of redemption, it produces behavioral change. And he describes this with a metaphor. It's a very Jewish metaphor, the metaphor of walking. It indicates the, this action-packed intention of being full of the knowledge of God's purpose. The Old Testament often pictures uh, the life of a believer as someone who is on a pathway, even with competing pathways in view. So here's Paul raising world's wisdom, God's wisdom, as Solomon would have raised the path of wisdom, the path of folly. So you have these options, these roads, and someone's walk is their habit of life. It is their consistent conduct that moves them in a direction. So it's not, what's really not in view is every activity in isolation, but the collected whole 
of activities that qualifies a person, that shows who a person is. So his prayer is that the overwhelming quality of our life, the pattern, the habit of our life is fitting with Jesus. It makes sense. It matches him. It looks like him. This is very similar of an idea to when Adam was looking for his partner, and God brings these animals before him, and no partner was found that was fitting for him until God makes Eve, and he says, it's a match. Wow, right? The, 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 fitting, the, the helper fitting for him. And that very similar is, is to what we're looking for here. We're, we're looking for that practice that matches who we are in our new man. We've been reborn by the Spirit of God. He's given us new life. And that has implications. That means our life should, I mean, it should look perfect. It should look just like Jesus. No, it doesn't. But the knowledge of God moves. It sanctifies. It progressively changes us that our walk would fit Jesus, which is fully pleasing to him. There is a divine smile on the life that is matching his son. And ultimately, let us remind ourselves, who is accomplishing this work? He who begun a good work in you will bring it to completion. So his smile is not on your obedience for your obedience sake. His smile is on his work of grace in your life that is transforming you toward glory, where we will look like Christ. Notice the connection here between knowledge and activity. That also is a very Hebrew idea. If you know, you do. If you don't do, you haven't known. You don't understand. So it's not, it, here, here's a, a distinction, not a separation, but a distinction between what that which is, could be intellectual and ineffective. That's not what we're talking about. We're not something, talking about something you can intellectually understand and it not affect you. It moves. It causes growth. So he then considers four qualities of the Christian walk. Now, this is like, what does that look like? He said the purpose of it moves you there, but what is that practically? What are, the, what are the evidences, you might say, of a walk like this? This is not an exhaustive list. It just demonstrates the activity that's suitable for a Christian. Four participles, those are the ones highlighted in red, each of which is modified by the prepositional phrase in black parentheses. Two of these are passive, being fruitful and being strengthened. Two of them are active, increasing and giving thanks. The first two kind of function as a pair together. Uh, we would recognize that for two reasons. One is that they are connected grammatically with this chi, this and, and they also are a pair from verse six. Okay, this is what the gospel did previously. Uh, the, the, the time of Thanksgiving looked backward and said, look, the gospel already did that. The gospel brought forth fruit, uh, forth fruit and caused increase. It caused growth. And now he's saying, and these things, those things that already happened, continue. They continue to uh, grow in your, in your own life. So now he's not pointing backward at regeneration or first steps. Here the supplication is pointing forward to the responsibility of a believer. This connection is clearly demonstrating that these fruits are the result of the gospel not a personal discipline or a mustering up of virtue inside ourselves, as, ironically, the Greek mind would suggest. So this fruitfulness demonstrates itself how? Well, in every good work. Think of, you know, a fruit basket or a cornucopia, all kinds, a flower garden, like just all sorts of varieties is what he's talking about. Every different kind of goodness, of morality, of activity is present, and it, and it abounds. The fruit of the Spirit comes to mind here as well. Like it just, it does that. It accomplishes that. Even looking back to his, to his initial thanksgiving, why did he give thanks? Because of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and their love for all the saints. That would be a good example of being fruitful in every good work. 
that the effects of the gospel have rippled through the Christian community in every sort of beautiful way. He describes that as love of the saints. So, a word of caution, we're not, he's not encouraging the pursuit um, of a general community ethic, but instead to live out the particular effects of the gospel, first in the family of faith, and secondly, in the world beyond. So, this is not instruction toward legalism, but an argument that mor moral activity, love, flows out of the gospel rather than toward the gospel. We'll touch on that in application at the end. So, fruitful and then increasing. Increasing would be a synonym for growing in the knowledge of God. So, we have it again, this knowledge that's presented, that the Christian increases with reference to uh, information that moves has already been clearly inferred by verse 6, which caused thanksgiving, and then Paul's explicit request that we would be, that God would fill us with this knowledge. So, this paradigm indicates to us the same thing that the wisdom literature of the Old Testament indicates to us, and that is that on this path of wisdom, this path of righteousness, let's say the path or the, the, the women on the path, Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly, they call to you. They cry out for attention. And what they're wanting is a full commitment. They want the lives of young people dedicated to them. And so, let's say someone takes a step on the path of wisdom. They possess the knowledge of God. They have been, let's say they're regenerated and they're, they're moving toward Lady Wisdom. Praise the Lord. So, they're done with the knowledge of God. The path is over. I'm on the path. No, that's why it's illustrated by the metaphor of a walk. <laughs> Here we go. We, we are continuing to walk, continuing to move through this life. And so we take continued steps in the grace of God toward growth, towards understanding, toward developing theologies. I was just talking with Leanne about this last week. I was like, it's amazing how well I feel like I know the Bible and how very little I feel like I know about the Bible. Like, I've grown up all around it. I know it you know, like the back of my hand in one way. And also like, wow, like it's so many, it feels like undiscovered places. Truth, just rich theology being built in the knowledge of God. And it moves us, it changes us. So that's the intention of these first two, this, this first pair. Now, <clears throat> Despite Paul's best efforts, <laughs> it might be easy for us, for our gaze, to shift towards ourselves and to say, how? How do I? How do I do that? I fail so often. Me, just continue learning and growing and that my life looks like Christ. It just, it's easy to gaze inward. I'm so weak. I get so easily anxious. I'm discouraged or angry, depressed. Just look at the habit of my life. It doesn't always look right. I'm simple-minded. Maybe I am, you know, an intellectual, arrogant individual, or I don't understand. I'm non-academic. I don't get it. I don't understand what's happening. Whatever it is, just all these, all this stuff, all this noise that causes us to really look at ourselves. And here, in this third characteristic, this passive characteristic, God reminds us how, <laughs> how this happens. He says, being strengthened with all strength. Being empowered with all power. according to His glorious power. Once again, we have every, so we are strengthened with unlimited strength. Strengthened to the highest degree of strength. Strengthened to the greatest strength imaginable. You feel like that? <laughs> Not always. Don't always feel like that. And how is it that we would know this? How is it that we would believe that this could be true? Because it is according to the strength of God, according to His power, 
qualified by this adjective glorious. Don't think glorious like glorious sunset. Think glorious like the character of God glorious. Think the weight of His majesty glorious. He has all power. And He gives us all strength. Why would He do that? Well, so that we can suffer well, of course. <laughs> so that we can suffer well. That's why He does it. Though it may be exciting to access an immeasurable source of power for our own personal advantage. We have ideas of what we could do with all power. If we were truly strengthened there, our personal advantage quickly jumps in the driver's seat. But Paul suggests something more intimidating and more necessary. This is a resource toward humble endurance. It's a resource toward the acknowledgement that I am weak, but he is strong. It's a resource toward the reality that in Christ, we will suffer. In this world, we will have much trouble, but be of good heart, I have overcome the world. Surely, if we have every measure of divine strength at our fingertips, we are enabled to stand firm in the face of whatever comes. This is the fruit of the Spirit of God in us. Patience and endurance, patience and long-suffering. These two are pair very closely related, not identical, but what they do is they, they build um, a picture of a person with an immovable faith and an immovable character, a person who is steadfast, someone with a never-turn-back mentality, even in the face of devilish circumstances. It reflects a quantity of calmness that doesn't retaliate even to those friends who betray you for 30 pieces of silver. One scholar summarized these two well. He said, endurance is what faith, hope, and love bring to an apparently impossible situation. And patience is what they show to an apparently impossible person. So in all circumstances, and toward all people, we have endurance. We have a calm, steady spirit that will continue in the faith that we've received in the knowledge of God, one more step on this walk, one more step. Toward our inheritance, right? Toward our inheritance. The fourth and final quality, uh, I guess we should note the, the with joy here. You might see, depending on your translation, that, that I rearranged it. So, our supplied verse break follows with joy. And grammatically, it can either point backwards that we suffer with joy, or it can point forwards to giving thanks with joy. And for two reasons, we want to put it with giving thanks. Um, for the grammatical parallelism, because Paul has given four parallel ideas, and each one of them is qualified with a prepositional phrase, and so this is the prepositional phrase of the fourth quality. Second reason would be that thematically it makes sense. While the, the suffering with joy is certainly a principle, um, joyful gratitude thematically goes together in this text, and the, we, we are really able to evaluate them to, uh, individually and then together, rather than blending joy and strength, if that makes sense. <clears throat> so giving thanks with joy to the Father. That reminds us of verse 3, that Paul and Timothy gave thanks to the Father. So now he says, that giving thanks with joy to the Father is also um, something that qualifies the life of a believer. So Paul, as Paul exemplified it in verses 3 through 8, the life of a believer is oriented toward gratitude as well. Now this fourth quality of life is um, more than, I think it is, but it's more than just being grateful. What this does, giving thanks with joy, calls to mind the ancient tradition of God's people to praise God privately and publicly. 
to adore his character, to remember his faithfulness, and thereby to confess him as Lord to all who will hear. It's an act of remembering. It's an act of submission. It's an act of worship whereby God's authority is put on display. We give thanks with joy to him. This is in large part what Psalms does. They are giving thanks with joy to the Father. In many of the songs, many of them are oriented otherwise, meaning they have a different theme, a different sound. But many of them are, get, are, are joyful songs. So this is an act of worship that we do individually and together. This worship is the proper response to the reality that everything we have, even religiously, everything that we have is something that has been given rather than something that has been earned. It's an old Christian saying that theology is grace and ethics is gratitude. What he means by that is that if it's true that God's attitude and activity toward us is primar primarily uh, qualified by characteristic of that which is gracious, it is giving, if it's been given to us, then our primary response, the ethics, should be primarily thanksgiving, should be primarily gratitude. And therein lies one of the greatest distinctions of the Christian faith, that what we do is a response rather than a movement toward him, seeking to garner his attention. And this habit of thankful living, joyful thankfulness, becomes a fundamental tool for the Christian in warding off these programs of rules for true and better spiritual fulfillment. They help us to, un uh, to maybe demask the lies of our culture, because what is more than what we have? Now, inside this final quality, giving thanks, is the second sermon. And we'll move through this quickly. It could, we could have broken here and spent another week on this, but we will, we will move quickly through these. So giving thanks with joy to the Father who, there's our connection, the Father has done three things. He has qualified us, He has delivered us, and He has conveyed or transferred us. It is this is a story of the redemptive work of the Father through the Son that is foundational for the walk to the Christian. So Paul's initial request, make this connection, this is important. Paul's initial request is that we would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And we identify the knowledge of God's will as the redemptive intention, the purpose of God in salvation. That's described right here. This is the purpose of God in redemption. So knowing this produces a joyful Christ-like life. Knowing that you have been qualified to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Now that takes us back to Old Testament ideas where God has made big promises to his people of which we were not participants. We were not invited. <laughs> and now, by the work of Christ on the cross, we have been qualified by the eternal decrees of God in His generous kindness toward us individually and corporately. We have been marked as those who have a piece of the pie. Like we get to share in the glorious inheritance of the saints which he identified last week as the hope that is within, the hope that is reserved in heaven for you. We get that through Jesus. This is um, a clear statement of that which he will speak later, the mystery of God that's now revealed in Jesus. The mystery was this advance, this international advance of the gospel to the Gentiles. So we rejoice in this, particularly as a generally Western church, that the gospel came here because of Jesus. We have an inheritance because of Jesus. And his second two is deliverance and conveyance. They go together. <clears throat> These happened simultaneously. Rescue and transfer. 
concurrently. And they describe two simultaneous acts of separation. He has delivered us from, away from, the authority of the king of darkness. And he has transferred us toward, into, directionally, the kingdom of the king of light. Out of darkness, into light. This is one of the most beautiful metaphors. It's the most beautiful story. This picture that's painted upon regeneration, there is a transfer. And the story told is a story of two kings, two great kings, who rule with authority over their kingdoms. This idea of power and ruler is a theme in Colossians. It'll be developed very strongly in chapter 2. Well, and next week, actually, because Jesus is over all the powers. But it communicates authority, a, a right to reign, so there's these two kings, one of them dark, one of them light, and it looks to the untrained eye that the kingdom of darkness, the king of darkness, he possesses a very vast and a dominant kingdom that holds authority over the majority of humanity. We too were once slaves of that dark king, weren't we? We served him, his evil and chaotic rule is the kingdom into which we were born and the kingdom into which we would still live with allegiance were it not for this second king, were it not for this story of deliverance. That the king of light, who as you gaze longer and longer at the story and as the Spirit of God gives you eyes to see it, to put these two kings next to each other is ridiculous. That's a joke. <laughs> that, the kingdom, that the king of darkness is, has any power? No, he has no power except, just like Pilate, that which was given to him by the Father. And this king of light, he determines toward rescue mission. He determines toward a transfer. I'll take that one, I'll take that one, I'll take that one, and he takes whomever he pleases out of this darkness he frees them from their chains and he sets them in his own kingdom of light to serve him, to serve him with joy. So the, while there are many skirmishes throughout history between these two kings, make no mistake, the dark one fancies himself a match. Satan fancies himself a match for Jesus. But he is none. He was made by Jesus. And Jesus will have the final word. So there's this story of deliverance and transference. Again, the word for power is one of the key words here describing authority. So either, well, we need to look at this last phrase. Who is it that is identified as the king of of the kingdom of light. He's identified here, the kingdom that belongs to the beloved son. That's a familiar phrase. The beloved son is the king of light. And it is, finally, in this king, by union with this king, that we possess redemption. We've been given redemption restated the forgiveness of sins. So these two are parallel. I have to say, just because some of you will see it, some have translations with through his blood and some do not have translations with his blood. The textual evidence for through his blood is very light. I don't think it's intended to be here. Ephesians 1.7 states this explicitly. So maybe jot down Ephesians 1.7 in the reference and if you, or in the margin if you're wanting to see um, why it's there, I'll actually reveal in a moment. So we have redemption. Redemption <clears throat> reminds us of the effects of Jesus' death. That's another description of the transfer from darkness to light. It's a, a transaction by which a price 
has been paid in order to secure someone's freedom from chains toward liberation. And most often, when you consider the topic, the theology, the idea of redemption, you must also consider a ransom. What is the price that needs to be paid? That's why through his blood is supplied here. It's to identify the ransom that Ephesians very clearly identifies. So I don't believe he says it here, but this is the price that was paid in order to accomplish redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, describe this again. He says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. It spoke bad things about you. It spoke the truth about you. But he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it, to the cross. And when he did that, he disarmed every power. He disarmed the greatest of those little p powers, this kingdom of darkness, and he ridiculed them. He made a spectacle of them because he triumphed over them in the blood of his cross, and he freed every one of those who are in Christ. That's what he's accomplished. That is why we give thanks. That is why, as we will next week, we will worship and consider the Son. The Son in the beauty of His character. A few words of application and we'll be done. Prayer then, <clears throat> as the Apostle has prayed it, this is an excellent ministry of the saints, that we would be people who pray for each other. Prayer makes a difference because of who is listening and because of who we are praying to. It's a meaningful form of service to the body of Christ. And so I would encourage you toward prayer. It costs no money. It takes very little physical strength. You can do it in your youth and you can do it in your age. And so we bring each other before the Father. This form of service humbly acknowledges our need, that we are weak, but he is strong. We are ignorant, but he is not. We are poor, but he is rich. We cannot escape, but he is the great deliverer. Not only is this an excellent ministry, but Pauline prayers and other ones that we find in the Psalms and, and elsewhere, they are excellent patterns of prayer for us. Feel very free to pray the words of Scripture back to God. Paul's prayer is spiritual, it is God-centered, it is detailed, it is theological, that we could add to it. <laughs> no, we can't add to it. So speak the words of God back to him. When you don't know what to say for a Christian brother or sister, open to Colossians 1, open to Ephesians 1, open to a psalm, and intercede for your family. I cannot help but notice that there is a great pastoral responsibility that is alluded to in this text. Paul is praying. Timothy is praying for the church. And he says in chapter 4 that Epaphras has worked himself tirelessly in prayers for the saints. Acts 6, the intention of deacons for the church is in order to free the pastors toward, their energies toward, the ministry of the Word of God and prayer. And so as a reminder to us, to Pastor Matt and to myself, this is one of our duties toward you. We pray for you. We pray for the members of this family. We love you dearly. And this is one of the things that we pour out our energies toward, is to bring you before the Father. It's also why we pray for each other in our prayer service. Finally, the power of truth. The point of Paul's request, that we'd be filled with truth. That we'd be filled with knowing who God is. That we'd be filled with 
the accurate gospel. That is powerful. This word of truth is powerful. While we might urge caution and, you know, simply tossing someone a verse and calling it a day, there's no doubt that the establishment and growth of our faith occurs here. It occurs from these words of life. And so we will return to it. We will return to it time and time again. We will open it, we will preach from it, and we will acknowledge that it is the source of our activity. That again is a unique distinctive of Christianity. Other faiths say that activity moves you toward God. And Christianity says nearness to God produces activity. And so we will continue in these and by God's grace be transformed into people who are benevolent moralists, active in all varieties of goodness, diligent students, applied to knowing God's word better, empowered sufferers, unprovoked by difficulty, circumstantial or interpersonal, and joy-filled beneficiaries, grateful for redemption.